Welcome to episode 61 of the Miami Tech Pod. On our last episode, you heard us recap Miami Tech Week. And so for this week's episode, we're bringing you a recording of one of our favorite talks during the week, which was a conversation between co-host Will Weinrob, who's also the co-founder of OnChain Studios, and the co-founder of Doodles, Jordan Castro, also known as Poopy. We hope you'll enjoy the episode. The next conversation is focused on building brands on the blockchain. Now, a lot of well-established brands have the ability to borrow from what you already know. But our next two conversationalists are going to lead us on a journey to understand what it's like to build a brand from scratch on the blockchain. Talking about NFTs and IP and really how you leverage Web3 to advance your brand with community at the center. Please welcome to the stage Jordan Castro, who is the co-founder of Doodles, and my friend and OG of Miami Tech, Will Weinrob, who is the co-founder and CEO of OnChain Studios. Let's give him a warm round of applause as we talk about building brands on blockchain. Hey, guys. <laughs> All right. What's up, Miami? How you doing? Uh, it's super excited for this convo. Jordan, thank you so much for, for doing this, man. First off, welcome to Miami. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of the scene here? You know, you've been here for a little bit. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty shocking to see all of my friends who are founders of companies in Web3 uh, move over to Miami and collectors in my space, the NFT space move over. I think that, you know, the city is very welcoming and um, the Local leaders, business leaders, political leaders are very receptive towards uh, including, you know, our emerging tech. Yeah, definitely. And you, like, I think a lot of us start to feel like Miami is becoming a center for Web3 NFTs blockchain. Do you feel that energy as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it seems like just a lot of activity happening here. And we're really excited for this convo. So like Jordan's one of the co-founders of Doodles. How many people here know Doodles? Raise your hand. Okay, awesome. How many people here own an NFT? Just curious. Awesome. More than I thought it would be, yeah. frankly. Uh, how many people don't know about NFTs but are excited to learn more about NFTs? All right, so we got a good mix. So today we wanted to talk, Jordan, about building brands, right? And how communities are a central part of that, obviously, especially when it comes to Web3, yeah. blockchain, and NFTs. Uh, before we dive into that, real quick, maybe you could just give the audience just a quick you know, minute or two background on you and how you got started in the space. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up on an island called Saipan. I lived there for 17 years. It's a U.S. territory next to Guam. Um, growing up, you know, the first significant possession that I owned was a computer, and I had dial-up internet. I learned about online communities and games that had you know, player run economies. So I got completely just infatuated with the idea of trading virtual goods, similar to what NFTs are you know, right now, or one use case of NFTs. And um, since then, you know, I've always been in and around tech. Um, I was early into Bitcoin and Dogecoin in 2013, building products like prediction markets um, that ultimately failed. And it wasn't until I heard about um, NFTs, or sorry, CryptoKitties mm -hmm. uh, in November 2017 to where I jumped back into crypto. I built tools for CryptoKitties and within a couple months, um, I joined Dabra Labs as the product lead of CryptoKitties and led it for you know, consecutive years. Um, Dabra Labs being you know, responsible for creating the non-fungible token standard. Uh, so I got to the chance to work with brilliant people over there and uh, it was, I would say six months ago, I left to start Doodles with uh, my co-founders. That's awesome. Well, yeah. tell me about that moment where you were like, okay, we want to start a new project and community in this space. Like, what were you seeing happening in the NFT space that made you like, you know what, now's the time and I have this yeah. idea and I want to start Doodles? Yeah, so when it comes to NFTs, um, there are waves of adoption. It's, uh, it's very cyclical. We have, you know, hype, boom, bust, and we see that cycle repeated over and over. I joined CryptoKitties after the viral bubble of CryptoKitties popped, and it was hard for us to change the narrative away from digital cats that sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars into tech that will actually change the world. 
Um, so, you know, fast forward a couple of years, NBA Top Shot in 2021 did incredible volume. You know, it was responsible for this recent wave of NFT adoption. And seeing that, you know, helped me get more confidence that it was the time to launch a project of our own. And really the motivation there was we wanted to be, we wanted to create an IP that we're fully, uh, we have full ownership of. And we want to give some of that IP to our collectors as well. And, you know, there are a lot of experiments that I wanted to play around with, like uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that I didn't have the opportunity to at the time. Um, so that, you know, that inspired the move to found Doodles. That's awesome. And yeah. talk about how that whole thing came together. I mean, Burnt Toast, he's such a fantastic, yeah. I mean, the art, if you guys have seen Doodles, it's just, the art is just absolutely incredible. And frankly, I feel it's iconic yeah. at this point. So just talk about how that whole thing came together with Burnt Toast. Yeah, yeah. So I have two other co-founders, yeah. Scott Martin, also known as Burnt Toast. Yeah. Uh, he is a visual artist, an icon iconographer, um, amazing vector illustrator, and he has a unique, cynically optimistic style. And Scott has been, you know, creating for the biggest brands in the world for decades now as a freelancer. Scott never really had, you know, full ownership of his, his IP due to the contracts that he was signing. Um, and my other co-founder is Evan Keast, who I worked with at Dapper Labs. And, you know, we, we've built together, we've built many features on Ethereum for CryptoKitties together. Um, so we already had that sort of synergy and it wasn't until like January 2021 where I was talking to Evan and we've been meaning to do a project together for many years. And, um, you know, we looked at our network and Evan knew Scott because he's worked with Scott. Mm. And Scott just has a very inclusive, very resonant art style that really nailed uh, what we see today with, with Doodles. And it's, you know, built off of his decades of experience and frankly, his imagination and brand. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just every time I look at the art, I don't know, you just can't help but feel happy and excited, right? And uh, I want to talk about the C word community. So important, right? When it comes to building a brand, especially in Web3, you don't have a community, you don't have a strong brand. We're going to talk about today, there's a lot of big companies that want to get in the space, and we'll get into that in a second. But you know, Jordan and I are both building companies. I'm building a company called Cryptoys with OnChain Studios. We're creating our own IP from the ground up, right? Uh, Doodles has this iconic brand, and it also has, frankly, what I feel is an iconic community. You join, you buy a Doodle, everybody's following you on Twitter and saying, like, what's up, dude? Welcome to the family. The Discord is a vibe in its own right. So can you talk about the community of Doodles? And for folks that are in here that are interested in building brands organically, like, was there any like secret sauce or things that you did at the onset that just cultivated such an amazing community? Yeah, I think um, we established pillars for how we wanted to grow the product, grow the community, and grow yeah. the brand. Those pillars were um, inclusivity, self-expression, and just good vibes. And, you know, if you joined our community early on, there were less than a thousand of us really just chatting away up until the release of Doodles. Um, and we only had one rule in our community, and it's don't be an a-hole. And... Um, That's a good rule. Yeah. And it... it, it, it we, we started the community very small uh, so that we can, you know, help people see our vision, help people onboard into our value system and structure so that when we knew we were going to be hyper successful, they can become advocates. And it's easier to tell that to 1,000 people than to 30,000 people. So to give you metrics and put it into perspective, um, I would say we had 1,000 members of our community by the time we launched. Uh, 25,000 were trying to get into our community, but you know, we deliberately closed the doors to our Discord until after the sale concluded uh, because we wanted to really just foster advocacy and then arm these people to help convert the new 25,000 people that came in uh, after the sale started. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, I'm continually impressed with just the, the, the brand that you're building. And as, as you are continuing to build out the, the legacy of Doodles, right? You start with an NFT project. How do you think about the roadmap of su such a company? Again, this is from scratch. It's like you're building a Disney, of sorts, right? With its own characters, its own lore. Yeah. 
how do you think of that? You start with a profile pic yeah. a NFT project, and then how do you build off of that? Right? Yeah, in a way, it's like we've built the cart before the horse. Right. Um, looking at the metrics, Doodles has done over $300 million in volume. We've reached over 100 million people. We've been in almost every major media publication. You know, we have half a million fans across socials. Um, tens of thousands of people attend our events. And the important thing that we needed to do really, like even right now, is create a deeper story, create a deeper narrative. And when we look at you know, the biggest brands in the world or biggest media franchises, um, how they got there is very important, their original media. Mm. You know, but with their main characters, they have a story. Like right. Hello Kitty is a good example from Sanrio. Um, Hello Kitty's story is Hello Kitty is from the suburbs of London Hello Kitty thinks that you cannot have enough friends and Hello Kitty loves to bake. Like they have a story for everything. And when we launched, right, we had a super successful sellout, mm -hmm. but we didn't have, a, we didn't identify our main characters. We didn't identify what it means to be a doodle. We didn't identify how a doodle breathes, talks. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. So there's different parallels and tracks to what we're building. One is for, you know, the NFT audience. The other is for the mainstream. And the third track really is for our story Bible, our lore, um, and our, our culture. That's exciting. And also curious, again, a lot of these Web3 native brands, we see a lot of them popping up. Yeah. You guys had an epic installation at South by Southwest. I mean, it was all over the media and Twitter. Like, you guys set up some amazing in real life experiences. How do you guys feel about that when it comes to building community? There's so much to be done digitally, but also, it, it should brands like not take for granted this in-person experience. Like right now, these are some powerful connections that we're making here at Emerge. I'm sure at South by you have a number of stories of people that walked up to you and you forged amazing relationships. How should folks in the audience think about when they're building their brands, mixing digital and real life experiences? Yeah, so South by Southwest, we had a walkthrough immersive experiential warehouse that lets people um, bring their doodles passport if they're a doodle holder and interact with the, the, the environment. Mm -hmm. Everything from the coffee that you're getting will have your doodle to uh, interactive. That was crazy. <laughs> it was, the it was. doodle in the coffee. Amazing. <laughs> to being able to put your yeah. doodle in a rocket, to control the environment around you, yeah. be greeted as your doodle, and really just share that experience with people who are not aware of NFTs. So South by Southwest was a very deliberate decision for us in terms of we wanted to cut through the noise. We wanted to go to where the mainstream was or people who were not already into NFTs and we wanted to show up. Um, it was a three day you know, activation yep. that cost us many millions of dollars. Um, but the value that we got from showing how NFTs interact with the real world and being able to break out of our, our bubble was, was incredibly important to us. Um, yeah. It's amazing. No, and I, 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 there was a turning point, I felt like, with the community after South by Southwest. There was just like another level of like, there's another vibe, you know what I mean? In like a way, that. like we growth hacked Instagram shareability. Yeah. Every single inch of that event space, it was like a 20,000 square foot warehouse, was highly Instagrammable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for three days, everyone in our space's Twitter feeds was just filled with people like smiling. They had yep. so much joy just taking photos of, you know, our event. So. Yeah, no, it was amazing. I, I recommend for anybody that's looking to do uh, in-person event experiences, check out what they did at South by. I think it'll be a case study yeah. for there, there is a case study. It's yeah. on uh, VT Pro Design. They're based out of California and yeah. they are exceptional in engineering and building experiential uh, activations. I also want to talk about, I mean, you and I are building our own organic uh, IP characters from the ground up with their own lore and storylines. There's a lot of brands that now want to jump into the space, in the NFT space. They're bringing their IP, iconic characters, into the NFT yeah. space. Also, we see athletes jumping into the space, you know, lots of celebrities. Yeah. Some of these uh, NFT launches and drops have been successful. Others have been met with backlash. Communities and uh, just, you know, the audience in general sees it as a cash grab, right, for many of these projects. Yeah. How can some of these legacy brands, because it's very important that they play in the space as well, how do they do so in an authentic way? Because like Doodles, Bored Apes, like Artifact, like all these companies, like what you guys have done is like you're true to the essence of Web3. It's Web3 native. And these brands that are jumping in, it kind of feels like sometimes the antithesis, but there is a middle ground. So how, how do companies 
think about that? How can they get in the space thoughtfully? Yeah, it, it's no secret that in blockchain and NFTs, there are half a million monthly active traders that have a very, very large you know, ticket, or very, very large amount traded. Yep. Um, but this audience there consists of very savvy people who have you know, a good understanding of economics, who have maybe experienced projects that have rug pulled, and rug pull mm -hmm. is a term that we use for when a project just disappears, like a fly-by-night project. Um, I think that being very authentic is important, but having that authenticity through not immediately going for the sale. Mm -hmm. Like, you can decide to sell something or you can decide to give something away. And CryptoPunks, one of the most established NFTs out there, was given away. Right. Um, so the sentiment is always changing because it is a market. And you know, when people do well, people are happy. Yep. They expect more of it. Uh, when people don't do well, then it can turn on you. Um, so I think that... Um, just understanding the sen sentiment and being authentic and not trying to be a tone deaf is important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's cyclical. Like we, We've been in NFT since 2018. Yep. We've seen really depressing bear markets to where we would not even mint an NFT for $2. We would not even pay the gas. Yeah, we were just talking backstage how we saw like <laughs> CryptoPunks. They were like 30 bucks. The gas fees were more than buying a CryptoPunk for 30 bucks. It was like yeah. wild days. So yeah. really just being authentic and yeah. making sure you're not tone deaf and having your ear to the ground with what's going on and playing to the sentiment. A two-way conversation is important, right? Like building community, you have to listen as much as you're talking. I think that sometimes brands are so used to marketing through a megaphone, right? Just like blasting out marketing. And yeah. really the, the Web3 kind of community, the NFT community is all about conversations yeah. back and forth and building relationships. So, I mean, uh, tra traditional marketing doesn't really work in our yeah. industry. A lot of people are really immune to it. Yep. Um, ad decay is real and like I have friends who have started projects and all they've simply done was tweet out a link to a discord and say yep. that I'm turning this discord off in 12 hours and lo and behold 30,000 people show up and Crazy. now they have a yeah that's a good hack by the way I don't think about that one. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about IP rights and ownership rights a big part of web3 like for example board API club a lot of you, you guys here in the audience know a uh, very successful NFT project uh, they give away the rights completely to token holders, or for the most part. You could use your ape commercially and to different applications and branded and whatnot. Doodles has a little bit of a different approach. Cryptoys also, frankly, has a different approach to that too. Can you talk about like the middle grounds, the pros and cons yeah. to that, and how you think about that in general? Yeah, this is a hotly debated topic right now. And yeah. There is a spectrum to licenses in our space currently. On one end, you have CC0 or CCO, right. um, where anyone can have the rights to commercialize anything. So even if you own it, does not gives you e exclusive rights. Right. Board Apes, you know, is one step down for that. It's more um, more restrictive in, in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at that and we looked at what people were doing with their rights, and we felt like it's a bit early for us in our journey. We've only been around for six months, and we felt like if we were to give everyone full commercialization rights, we would have less control of the story and the narrative that we have yet to create. Right. We'd be put a little more at risk of brand dilution. And we thought that we had a better solution to this. We, you know, at the end of the day, a doodler owns their doodle. They mm -hmm. can commercialize it for up to $100,000 doing almost everything they want to do. But instead of giving them, like adding those lines of text to our license, making it more permissive. We rather show them by doing and build a product that helps them easily bootstrap their business to commercialize their doodles, similar like to Funko Pop. Let's imagine we bought out Funko Pop and we wanted to create a line of new digital or new physical toys, but we didn't want to create these physical toys from thin air. You know, we look to our collectors and ask them if they wanted to be part of this so mm -hmm. that they can have a share of that revenue. And that, that's what I mean by um, our, right. our approach. Yeah, there is a middle ground, right? Yeah. I think it's for such early days. And I think for, for brands like what you're building with Doodles, you need to, there needs to be some form of protection around that from the longevity that you yeah. want to go to. And that's in the benefit of the holders themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people think that that's at an odds, but oftentimes it complements mm -hmm. the longevity of the project. Um, Personal opinion, where are we in the NFT space right now? Like if you were to look back, there's like a timeline, yeah. right? You saw 
the onset with Dapper Labs and CryptoKitties and the NFT standard. Now I, I like to say we're in the, the PFP phase, right? That's how it started. I like to think that like when, when you look back on this five, 10 years, this is inning one still, right? We're right, really at the beginning. How do you feel about this from a timeline perspective? Where are we and where are we heading next? Like what's the future of this space? I feel like we are in a, in a state where the use cases are very narrow or what is coming up to the surface are very narrow mm -hmm. use cases. I think it could be widened tremendously. Yep. Um, NFTs could be anything. It could be your driver's license. It could be a contract between two parties. It could literally be a lease on your car or a rental agreement. Um, right now, the market really loves you know, these PFPs. And yep. a lot of the motivations are speculative. And I've built a lot of my career around rewriting or trying to shape the motivations of users, but sometimes you just can't. Um, I prefer like focusing more on joy-driven collecting rather than speculation. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not um, ignoring the fact that you know more than half of the people in the space right now love to speculate. Sure. Uh, so I think we're in a we're in the second or third cycle. I think that there's still room to you know maybe five x over the next 12 months in terms of the MAU or monthly active trader figure that I shared earlier. Um, yeah. Awesome. What do you think, in your opinion, is going to unlock the mainstream adoption of NFTs? Because we're still so early. It's like a meme. We're so early. Yeah. Frankly, we are early, right? Yeah. You look at the numbers, yeah. right? The, the, this is still a very early industry. And a lot of people are super interested in how they could find their niche uh, in the industry. You know, for me, like, I'm always looking for, like, on-ramps. Like, NBA Top Shot, you gave a great example, right? That was an on-ramp for millions of people that can recognize the NBA's brand, that were sports fans, fantasy sports fans, things like that. That was their on-ramp into NFTs. They paid with a credit card and then they dived deep into the world of Ethereum and started yeah. trading. Uh, what do you feel like is that unlock, or maybe there's a few unlocks, that's gonna really bring in the mainstream numbers for NFTs? Yeah, I think it's the ability to break through the preconceived notions of what an NFT is and really just give the user joy or value. Right. Like the moment that they hold it in their hand, they should be like, this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. This gives me a lot of joy or this gives me a lot of value. I think that um, a few industries are primed to break into the mainstream. Um, your company, for example, Cryptoys. Toys is a very you know underrated sort of sleeper in NFTs and Web3 right now. Um, the total addressable market for toys is incredible. Um, but creating that killer product at the core, if the NFT is tactile, if it's toyetic, if it's you know something that they that the collector or customer thinks is greater than the, its physical counterpart, then we have you know a product market fit, and then that can take off and break to millions yeah. of people. Yeah. I agree completely. I think again, we're so focused on price right now. Yeah. Floor. What's the floor? What's the floor? And 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 how we can make money here that that's quickly gonna turn in these different cycles, but entertainment, utility, joy, that's the primary function. And then the secondary market's the byproduct of those yeah. things, right? Yeah. So um, I'm really excited kind of for these next waves here and see kind of where the industry heads. I think, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, you know, what would be some words of encouragement for the audience? I know a lot of people are trying yeah. to jump into the space. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of energy and momentum. And I feel like with NFTs, we've kind of unlocked the creator economy again, yeah. right? There's like a renaissance that's happening with creators and designers and artists. So like some words of encouragement, like, you know, from yeah. inception of Doodles to now, such a wild ride and you took the leap of faith, what would you encourage yeah. folks in the audience uh, to- don't, you know? don't be scared to dive in. Um, you don't need to, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars on, you know, the right to NFT. Just join a community and see how brand, how it as a project or it as a brand can evolve with you being a stakeholder, um, because that's how I view our collectors. You know, they are stakeholders into our future, into our vision, and we basically love them, and we try to do right by them. And whenever we release a new product, we think about their needs. So, get in to NFTs, chat with someone you know. Um, don't spend too much money on your first NFT, and just really join the community and see how it evolves for better or you know for for worse. Yeah. <laughs> And get a hardware wallet, right? Super important, right? <laughs> Protect your assets. Yeah, yeah. All right, awesome.
Jordan, thank you so much yeah. for being here. Really appreciate it, man. Great thank talk. You so much. Look forward to seeing yeah. what you do next, man. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone.